I shared with you guys a few weeks ago that when I was a young man, one of the things I struggled with was stealing. And it, doesn't, it didn't matter what it was, a magazine, toys, trinkets, candy. Uh, there was just a season of my life where I think it helped me feel strong. It helped me feel like I was in control it, when there were areas of my life that uh, were not in control. I think, you know, I tried to impress my friends with it. And when I became a Christian, God started to deeply convict me of this sin in my life. And I, w- I wish I could say that it just stopped, but it didn't. God was working in me, but it still took a season to see this kind of sin work its way out of my life. And uh, I had good days where I had victory, and then I had bad days where I succumbed to the temptation to take things that weren't mine. But it felt like this wrestling match is battle. And there were days that I felt incredible victory, and there were days I felt incredible loss. But God kept working in my life. And eventually, he purged me of that desire to sin. And now that's so far back in my rearview mirror, that season of my life, and I just rejoice because that was the, the work of the Lord in me. And some of you can relate to that in your life. There, there's been issues, life-dominating sin issues in your life that you've had a wrestling match with. Because living as a Christian, uh, that's what we encounter. We encounter this battle between the flesh and the spirit, the flesh and the spirit. And and sometimes it feels like the flesh wins. Sometimes it feels like the spirit wins. Which one's going to win? And so maybe for you, it's been, you know, control issues in your life or gossip or maybe it was materialism or lust or greed or whatever it is. You can relate to this battle, but you've seen God's work in your life work its way out. And so when we encounter these challenges, sometimes it feels like we don't, are, uh, we don't have what it takes inside of us, that we're not equipped to have victory in these core critical areas of our life. But for the Christian, this couldn't be further from the truth. God has given us everything we need for direction, guidance, instruction, and victory over sin. Because he's given us himself. The Lord has given us himself. Now, as a Christian, you might be be thinking, well, yeah, I have Jesus with me. I know that I walk with Christ, and Christ is in my life, so I have Jesus, you know, by my side. But a stronger, more game-changing understanding of how God works is that the Holy Spirit in you is actually stronger and better than Jesus by you. And so God's given us his presence in our life to overcome these areas of temptation as he works in us and through us. And this is going to be the focus of our time together today as we dive back into this Apostles' Creed series where we've taken this well-written document from centuries ago formed by Christian leaders with the intent to um, really stay faithful to core critical Christian doctrine and weed out false teaching. And some of you have said the creed for you know, years, decades, some of you are new to it, but we're using the creed as kind of a roadmap or a guide to go to the Bible and see what the Bible has to say related to these statements we find in the creed. And today we're focusing on the statement, I believe in the Holy Spirit. Understanding who the Holy Spirit is And what the Holy Spirit does is really essential to us as Christians because the Holy Spirit tends to be misunderstood, misrepresented, and even controversial. And we really find two extremes with the Holy Spirit. We find some religious traditions and beliefs uh, way over here on neglect. Like, we don't talk about the Holy Spirit, we don't believe in the Holy Spirit, we don't address the Holy Spirit, we, you know, it's just totally dismissed. And then we have these other extremes of the Holy Spirit that are overemphasized, even uh, really um, false teaching, false practices, uh, unbiblical teachings related to the Holy Spirit that can lead to spiritual abuse. So we have these extremes, and a lot of us come to the table with the Holy Spirit going, I don't know what to think. And so we're going to look at God's Word today and understand more about who the Holy Spirit is and what He does. First, let's understand a little bit about who the Holy Spirit is. He is the third person in the triune nature of God. Again, this is the mind-warping but true understanding that God is one God, but He has chosen to uh, demonstrate Himself and reveal Himself with three distinct persons. I really like this diagram as an understanding to help. I've shared this before. It's one diagram. It's one you know, uh, image, but you know, one God. But we see that the Father is God, the Son is God, the Holy Spirit is God. 
yet. The Father's not the Son. The Son's not the Father. The Son's not the Spirit. The Spirit's not the Son. The Spirit's not the Father. The Father's not the Spirit. They're distinct. And so we look at the Holy Spirit, and He is a co-equal, co-eternal essence of God uh, with the Father and the Son. So when we study Scripture, we see the language referring to the Holy Spirit as a person. He is a person. And when we say person, we mean he's living, he's relational, he interacts with us, he thinks, feels, speaks, he has a will, he has intelligence, he has emotions. And so we don't want to make the mistake of depersonalizing the Holy Spirit and seeing him like something out of Star Wars, like a force, right? Or some vapor, or some sort of cosmic energy, or you know, something like that. That's not uh, an accurate understanding of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit of God is a personal being. He's not an impersonal thing. And, but at the same time, he is the Spirit of God. And because he's spirit in that sense, he's non-physical. He's normally invisible. And God has given us metaphors in the Bible to try to wrap our minds around who he is and what he does. So we see him related to fire and wind, uh, like clothing, a dove, a guarantee or a pledge or a seal, all these metaphors to understand who he is and how he works in our life. So we believe in the Holy Spirit as God has revealed him in his word to us. Another larger Christian creedal document in the 1600s called the Westminster Confession of Faith articulates who the Holy Spirit is this way. The Holy Spirit, the third person in the Trinity, proceeding from the Father and the Son of the same substance and equal in power and glory is, together with the Father and the Son, to be believed in, loved, obeyed, and worshipped throughout all ages. So that's a great statement of who the Holy Spirit is. But what does the Holy Spirit do? And that will be the focus of our time. We're going to try to drill down a little deeper in understanding what does the Holy Spirit do? And when we understand this passage, we see really quickly that he's one who comes to help us. He's one that comes to help us. So let's open up our Bibles to get more understanding on this. I invite you to open up to John, the book of John in the New Testament, the Gospel of John, chapter 14. And in John chapter 14, we're going to look at verses 16 through, I think, 26 or so. And uh, we're kind of a BYOB church, bring your own Bible. And so we count on you to have your own Bible with you so that you can interact with the text, uh, take notes. Maybe you've got a Bible app on your device that you take notes in and highlight and all that kind of stuff. We just are big on that. If you don't have a Bible, we would love to give you one as a gift for free. So stop by the information center on the way out, get a free Bible. But as we try to understand a little bit more about who the Holy Spirit is and what he does, one of the best voices to listen to is the voice of someone else in the Trinity, right? The voice of God speaking about God. And so we're going to listen to Jesus give us thoughts on the Holy Spirit here in John 14. And as we get ready to look at John 14, we're basically parachuting into a moment in the Bible where tensions are high, emotions are high. Jesus is with his disciples. Uh, he's talking about dying. He's talking about going away. The disciples are kind of freaking out a little bit. They're not really liking what they're hearing. And so Jesus is giving last-minute instructions. He's trying to calm them down. He's trying to prepare them for what's about to come. And that's where we parachute in here and look at something Jesus says about the Holy Spirit. John 14, verse 16. Jesus says, And I will ask the Father, and he will give you another helper to be with you forever. Even the spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive, because it neither sees him nor knows him. You know him, for he dwells with you and will be in you. I will not leave you as orphans. I will come to you. Yet a little while, and the world will see me no more, but you will see me because I live. You also will live. In that day, you will not know that I am in my father. In that day, you will know that I am in my father and in me, and I in you. Whoever has my commandments and keeps them, he it is who loves me. And he who loves me will be loved by my Father, and I will love him and manifest myself to him. Judas, not Iscariot, not the guy who betrayed Jesus, said to him, Lord, how is it that you will manifest yourself to us, 
not to the world. Jesus answered him, If anyone loves me, he will keep my word, and my Father will love him, and he will come to him and make our home with him. Whoever does not love me does not keep my words. And the word that you hear is not mine, but the Father's who sent me. These things I've spoken to you while I'm still with you. But the Helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things and bring to your remembrance all that I have said to you. Let's pray. Lord, thank you for your word. Thank you that it's perfect. It's truth. It guides us, teaches us, corrects us. Lord, pray that wherever we're at today in our spiritual journey, those watching online, those in this room, that we will take one step closer to knowing more about you, being more like you, walking in relationship with you. And Lord, we know that your Holy Spirit is the way you do that. And that your Holy Spirit transforms us, Lord. And so I pray that we will be responsive to the nudges of your Spirit today so that we don't just walk out of here with information for our heads, but application and transformation for our lives. So lead us, Holy Spirit, as we look closer at who you are. In Jesus' name, we all said together, Amen. amen. So what we see here is this phrase, Jesus refers to the Holy Spirit two times in this passage, multiple times in other passages, as the helper. So the Holy Spirit helps us, but how does he help us? Well, I'm gonna gonna rapid fire a list of ways that the Holy Spirit helps us. Those of you who like to take notes are going to hate me right now, okay? Take heart because it's on the blog, all right? So if you go to the CVC blog in the next couple days, you'll find it there. Uh, If you want to try to write down, good luck. Here we go. Here's some ways the Holy Spirit helps us. One, he instructs us and reminds us of what Christ has taught. He convicts the heart of sin and uh, righteousness and judgment. He guides us in the way of truth. He reveals God's will to us. He confirms to us that we are children of God and that we're saved. He helps us pray. He gives us spiritual gifts. He gives us the ability to overcome temptation. He calls us to repentance and renewal. He produces the fruit of the Spirit in our life. He gives and sustains physical life. He gives spiritual life and new life. He sanctifies and purifies us. He leads us and guides us. He empowers us and compels us to preach Christ. So the Holy Spirit does a lot for us, doesn't he? He really, really helps us. Now, I don't have time to unpack all those. I mean, we could take five minutes per bullet point if you really want to try, but instead, let's just go back to John 14, and let's just look closer at three of the ways that the Holy Spirit helps us. And the first way we see is that the Holy Spirit helps us by living in us. He lives in us. Look again at some of what Jesus said in John 14. He said, for you will know him, for he dwells with you and will be what? In you, in you, right? In verse 20, Jesus says, I am in my Father, and you in me, and I in you, right? Verse 23, Jesus says, if anyone loves me, he'll keep my word, and my Father will love him, and we will come to him and make our home with him. God did not give us some sort of spiritual accessory to help us in our life. He didn't give us something. He gave us some one. And so when you come to that moment of conversion, when you are done uh, trying to please God through good works, when you're done trying to fix your own life through your own ability, when you finally turn from trusting in yourself and trying to do life your way and surrender to the Lord and believe that Jesus died on the cross for your sins, believe that uh, Jesus rose from the grave to conquer sin and death, and when you come to the Lord at that moment of conversion, the Holy Spirit of God, the God that created all things in the universe, this is mind-blowing, comes and lives inside of you. You can even just do this. If you're a Christian, God's in here. That's mind-blowing because we know what's in here, right? We know what lurks in the recesses of our heart, that God loves us that much that he would want to come live with us and dwell with us. And so at that moment of conversion, he doesn't just give us like, here's some tools you, know, you can use. He says, I'm going to come live in you, and then I'm going to start to work in your life. And this should be very refreshing to us because most religious teaching says it's outside in. You've got to fulfill these rules. You've got to do these traditions. You've got to subscribe to these behaviors. And if you do all this stuff on the outside, eventually it'll kind of leak into the inside and you'll be good enough. That's not what the Bible teaches. 
That's not what God says. He says, you're a mess. You can't fix it. Stop trying. I'm going to move in, and I'm going to start working on you from the inside out. Like, that should just make you go, amen, and thank you, right? Because God loves us that much to come in, and then he starts to work on us from the inside out through the power of his Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is in us. That's why it's better to think about the Holy Spirit in you is really better than Jesus beside you. He's inside of you. And this is huge. And think about the, the disciples right now and how vexing and freeing this concept will be. Because being a disciple of Jesus means you're hanging out with Jesus all the time. You got 12 guys hanging out with the teacher of teacher, right? The counselor of counselor, the, the rabbi of rabbis. And you can just see the disciples as they're with Jesus. They're hanging with Jesus. They're walking into the village like, yo, we with Jesus, you know? And then all of a sudden the Pharisees are coming up and they're saying, hey, we're going to try to trap you with our words. And Jesus throws it back on them and stumps them. And the disciples are like, yeah, we're with him. Take that, right? And then all of a sudden they're in a boat storm on the Sea of Galilee, they're going to die. Jesus wakes up, calms the storm. They're on a mountain with thousands of people. No one's got anything to eat. What's Jesus do? Give me a few fish, give me a few pieces of bread, boom, feeds thousands with leftovers, okay? I mean, oh, Jesus, we can't pay the tax. They want us to pay the temple tax. What are we going to do? We don't have money. Go fishing. Catch that fish. Open up its mouth. There's a coin. Go pay the tax. On and on and on and on. So guess how good the disciples felt to be with Jesus, and then Jesus drops this bomb. I'm leaving you. I'm heading out, and where I'm going, <laughs> you're not going to be able to come. And they're like, what? So at that point in time, they probably felt absolutely disempowered. They're forecasting the future without Jesus going, how's that going to work? Like, we're going to go backwards now. And then Jesus says something so amazing to them. If, if you were to look forward a couple chapters, you'll find John 16. And we see some echoes in John 16 to John 14. And in John 16, 7, Jesus says this. He says, nevertheless, I tell you the truth. It is to your advantage. Some versions say it's to your good, right? It's to your advantage that I go away. For if I do not go away, the helper will not come to you. But if I go, I will send him to you. So now we look at the narrative of Jesus. And here, here in a month, we're going to celebrate his miraculous birth. And then we look at this miraculous sinful life. We look at this sacrificial death on the cross for the sins of mankind. We look at three days in the grave, raising on the third day, conquering death, conquering sin, hangs out for 40 days, lets people see him. Hey, see me, touch me, you know, smell me, you know, listen to me. And then he ascends to heaven like we talked about a couple weeks ago, right? And when he ascends, he sends the Holy Spirit. How is that an, an advantage? Because up to this point, the, the, the ministry of Jesus was localized. Like it was with those 12 guys or whoever Jesus was with. It was in Jerusalem. It was in Judea. It was in Samaria. But when he left and sent his spirit to live in all believers, then what happens is every believer's got the presence of Jesus, and now they're going all over. So isn't it an advantage that instead of 12 guys hanging out with Jesus in Jerusalem, now we've got millions of Christians all over the planet filled with the Holy Spirit doing God's work? That right now as we're sitting here as a Christian, we've got brothers and sisters in Christ in Asia, Africa, Europe. We've got them over there in India. We've got them over there in Indonesia. And they're also loving God. The Holy Spirit's working in them and through them too. Isn't that the advantage? And so this is like Jesus is going, this has been, good. This has been great, guys. It's going to get better because I'm going to send the Holy Spirit, and the Holy Spirit's going to come and live in you. And when he lives in you, he works in you. Philippians 2.13 says it's God who works in you both to will and to work for his good pleasure. And so we step back and go, God has sent the Holy Spirit to help us. And one of the ways he helps us is by living in us. We don't have to take a number. We don't have to wait in line. We don't have to get on hold. We don't have to send an email. He's right here, right now, 24-7 for you as a Christian and for every other brother and sister in Christ all over the world. That's an advantage. So he's in us. The second way he helps us is that he assures us. He assures us. This word that we see here, the helper, is the word paraclete or parakletos. It means one who comes alongside to help. Sometimes it's translated comforter or advocate. 
And the disciples needed comfort at this moment because they saw him going away. And, and Jesus wanted to reassure their hearts and to bring them assurance of who they were in Christ. Look at verse 18. It's one verse, but it hits like a hammer. Look what Jesus says. He says, I will not leave you as orphans. I will come to you. Jesus wasn't going to abandon them. He was going to move them into a chapter where the help and the identity was going to even increase as a child of God. And so uh, we see a lot of things when we understand this. Uh, the disciples were probably feeling like they were going to be abandoned and forgotten. And Jesus is hitting this head on saying, no, I'm not going to abandon you. I'm not going to forget you. I'm going to do something even better. I'm going to come move in with you and everyone else is to follow. And what happens is there's assurance that's taking place. And when he says, I'm not going to leave you as orphans, we understand that Jesus is saying that's a bad thing. Being an orphan is a bad thing. I think it's appropriate to look at this passage right now because November is Adoption Awareness Month. Today's Adoption Awareness Day. Last week was Orphan Sunday. And so we know that God has a heart for adoption. God doesn't want to see orphans. It should break our heart that right now there's over 26 million children on this planet with no mom and dad. No mom and dad, 26 million. And so God is uh, against orphans in the sense that he doesn't want them to be orphans. He wants them to be in homes. And so he's bringing this concept to the table to these guys. I'm not going to abandon you like that. And so we, we tie into that with our church when we are big on adoption. Uh, last service, we got to see a kid who was adopted into a forever home family get baptized. Uh, it was just a beautiful thing. It kind of jacked me up for a couple minutes watching this beautiful story unfold. And so we're big on adoption because God's big on adoption. And so just a reminder that after the service, maybe you've been thinking about or exploring the idea of adoption. We have an adoption information meeting. Uh, just go and listen. Uh, like I said last week, we're not going to stick you with a kid and make you walk away. You know what I'm saying? We're not, it's not like you're not going to get paired up and walk out. No pressure. But just come and listen and pray and think about adoption. But Jesus is hitting this concept of, no, I'm not going to leave you orphaned. I'm not going to abandon you. In fact, again, he says, we're going to come. The Father and I are going to come, and we're going to make a home with you. And this is going to be comforting for the disciples because all that they're hoping in, they feel like is being stripped away. And they're going to be forgotten and abandoned. And Jesus is saying, no. See, we need to be comforted by God and his spirit in the same way. Because everybody is really afraid of being abandoned. Even the most successful, wealthy person is afraid of being abandoned. Or that what they're staking their identity and self-worth in can be stripped away, leaving them feeling less, being less. For example, uh, what if you lose the job? What if you lose your title? What if you lose your uh, admiration? What if you lose your money or your house? What if you lose what you think is control over certain things in your life? What if you lose the image that you so desperately built up that somehow uh, you've staked your identity and self-worth in? If all that goes away, then what do you have? And so the Holy Spirit comes in and assures us that no matter what's taken away from us, if we're a child of God, that can't be taken away. That's not going to be taken away from us. Look what we see in Romans chapter 8. Romans chapter 8, it says, For all who are led by the Spirit of God are sons of God, for you did not receive the spirit of slavery to fall back into fear, but you've received the spirit of adoption as sons, by whom we cry, Abba, Father. The Spirit himself, here we go, bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God. The Holy Spirit assures us that once we come to faith in Christ, the grip that God has on you will never be loosened or opened. That once you're God, you're His, which should be so freeing because some of you, you're still trusting in your paycheck. You're still trusting what people think of you. You're still trusting in others admiring you for self-worth and identity. And here's the thing, all that can change and most likely will change. And the Holy Spirit tells you, but if you're my child, if you belong to the Father, that will always be the case. He'll never let go of you. He's not going to abandon you. He's not going to orphan you. Now, look, some of you are struggling with this right now because you're going, I feel forgotten by God. Like, let's be honest. How many of you ever felt forgotten by God? Come on, seriously. There have been times when all of us have felt forgotten by God, abandoned by God. Look, I don't know why God has not removed that painful thing from your life. I don't know why. I don't know why God has not given you one of the biggest desires of your heart. I don't know why. 
But do know this, he loves you, he hasn't abandoned you, he hasn't forgotten you, you're his. And the Holy Spirit just says, you've got to trust your father. You've got to trust his sovereignty. You've got to trust that he knows. And some of you are going, yeah, but he didn't give me everything I want. Okay, let's talk about that for a second. <laughs> if we talk to a child and they're given everything they want, would we say that's good parenting or bad parenting? Bad parenting. The kids are going, that's good parenting. <laughs> All the children right now are going, no, 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 that's good parenting. We know right now if we just, from the get-go, let our kid have everything they want, a lot of them wouldn't make it past 10, right? God knows what's best for us. God knows what's good for us. He, he, there's a reason he's withheld. There's a reason he's sustained. And all I know is that we can trust our Father, and we belong to him. And in those moments, the Holy Spirit's just pouring into you saying, I live in you, and I'm assuring you that you have a Father who will never abandon you or abuse you. You're his. That's one of the ways that the Holy Spirit helps us. We're going through this workbook uh, along with this series written by another pastor, Matt Chandler. He says something pretty clever. I really appreciate what he said on this concept. In that workbook, he says, this is what the Spirit of God does. He ransoms us out of being spiritual orphans, pulls us into the household of faith, and gives us a marker of being known, loved, provided for, cared for, and pursued. Been adopted into the family of God is an identity marker that nothing and no one can take from you. Through faith in the Son, by the grace of the Father, you're a spirit-filled member of his family. Forever. One of the terms in adoption culture is forever family. That when you adopt a child in your home, now they have that family forever. That's a good sentiment. I like it. I love it. I use it. But if we're to press into that concept further, there only is one family that's a forever family. And that's the family of God. And when you come to Christ, and the Holy Spirit comes to live in you, you have been adopted into the family of God forever. Never to be let go. And so the Holy Spirit helps us by assuring us of that. The third way he helps us is he teaches us. He teaches us. The Holy Spirit, or as Jesus calls him in John 14, the Spirit of truth helps us by teaching us, instructing us, guiding us, and because he's the spirit of truth, what he teaches is truth. John 16, 13, Jesus says, when the spirit of truth comes, he will guide you into all truth. This is where we need to really hear this, that God has helped us by giving us the Holy Spirit to live in us and assure us, but to teach us, because if we listen to our own hearts, and if we listen to the voices of man only, to humanity, we usually get, A, just human results, but we also get more of human problems. Because even the best friend with the best advice, if it's not from the Word of God, it's not from the Spirit of God, it's still at best human thinking and human advice. And it sounds good, but it's not rooted in truth. Like, let me give you an example of this. One of the phrases we use in humanity, and we'll probably talk about this next year in another teaching series, is follow your heart. Doesn't that sound great? Just follow your heart. Some of you are going, dang it, I just told my friend that yesterday. <laughs> now, now I'm finding out it's bad. Well, I don't know what to do. Should I do this or do that? Just follow your heart. Do you know what God says about our heart in the Word? It's wicked. It's wicked. It wants to run away. If you follow your heart, you're going to go straight to Vegas and live there the rest of your life. And whatever happens in Vegas, hopefully stays in Vegas, right? Like that's, that's you're going to run to sin ultimately. That's what's in our heart. And so we have to listen to the voice of the Spirit. Because the Spirit speaks truth to us. Well, okay, how do we know that's the Holy Spirit? Well, the first thing you need to know about, is it the Holy Spirit speaking to you? Or is it last night's pizza? Like you don't know the difference, okay? Because if we're going to be honest, is it my voice? Is it the Spirit's voice? Is it my, you know, my conscious, subconscious memory from a relative? Whatever. Is it biblical? The Holy Spirit's only going to tell you something that lines up with Scripture. Like I've had people say like, oh, like God's told me to divorce my spouse. No, he didn't. Because God says in his word, I hate divorce. That's what he says. Now, some of us have that come upon our life, and we've got to navigate that, and the Spirit will help us. But all of a sudden, you're going, oh, I'm just tapping out because I'm not happy. That's not God. Okay, that's not God's voice. That's not truth. That's humanity. That's selfishness. And we have all these voices swirling, and we have to come back to the Holy Spirit who takes like ordinary human advice, flips it, and gives us truth. 
We're going to have a man here in a few months named Daniel Henderson. He's written some great books on prayer, written one on the Holy Spirit. He says this in his book on the Holy Spirit. He says, the indwelling Spirit of God can make the mundane meaningful. I like that. How many of you would like to make some of the mundane in your life a little more meaningful, right? And the ordinary extraordinary as we walk with Christ day by day. Why? Because the Spirit's inside of us. The Spirit's going to turn what's boring and feeling like purposelessness into having purpose. That's, that's the work of the Spirit. He teaches us the things of God. And if you look through this passage, you'll notice this sub-theme. Jesus is saying, hey, look, if you love me, you'll do what I say. And if you don't, you won't. If you love me, you'll keep my commandments. And if you don't, you won't. And some of us go like, oh, well, Jesus said a lot. Like, how am I going to remember what Jesus said? Because he said a lot. What commandments is he talking about? This is where we go back to what we see in verse 26 in John 14. It says, the Holy Spirit, the helper, whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things. Let's stop there. Some of you, you you're coming from a church background. You, you don't know Christ. You're like, this is like, I showed up and this is all new to me. Guess what? If you yield to the Holy Spirit and let Christ in your life, he'll teach you all things. You'll be able to merge right into what God has taught his children for thousands and thousands of years. And so he'll teach you all things and bring to your remembrance all that I have said to you. All that Christ has taught, all that Christ has said, he's going to bring recall. Now look, he doesn't need the Bible to speak to you. Like the Holy Spirit doesn't need the Bible to speak to you. Okay? But what you'll see if he speaks to you, you'll find it in the Bible later. It'll be like, oh, that's why the Holy Spirit told me that, because it's right here. But typically what we see happen is we get into the Word of God, we get it in here, we get it in here, and we spend time with the Lord's Word, and then later on when we're doing our thing, the Holy Spirit recalls what we learned years ago and brings it online. That's how much he loves us. That's how available he is to us. Or what will happen is if you're a new believer and the Holy Spirit is, is drawing you, you'll, you know that you're following God, and then all of a sudden you'll open the word and go like, oh, I see how it works together. God's so cool that way. And so he teaches us he's going to recall the things of Christ. Well, how does that work? I mean, like even right now, as, as I'm teaching and you're listening, if you're understanding anything I'm saying, it's because the Holy Spirit is teaching me to teach you, and the Holy Spirit is helping you understand, and as you, and uh, as, as I, and you walk out these doors today, if we apply anything that we've heard, it's the Holy Spirit helping us apply it. So all, all, everything goes to God, right? All glory to God, everything from the Spirit. But what does that look like in reality? Let's just touch on this, because here's our daily battle compared to how the Holy Spirit will teach us. Like, for example, we've got spiritual apathy. He's going to teach you passion. We've got destructive behaviors, so teach you holy behavior. Destructive attitudes, he'll give you godly attitudes. Selfish living, he'll teach us compassion, generosity, and selfless living. Sinful cravings of the flesh, he'll teach you victory over sin, not slavery. Strained or broken relationships, he'll teach you about forgiveness and reconciliation. Doubts, he'll teach you belief. Fears, he'll teach you faith and trust. Discouragement, he'll teach you encouragement, peace, and comfort. Why? Because he dwells in us, and he empowers us, and he teaches us this way. And as the Holy Spirit works in us, eventually it starts to work its way out of us and through us. So exhibit A, the disciples. After Jesus died and rose and ascended, they were huddled in Jerusalem, and they were scared, and they were fearful, and they were stubborn, and they were arguing. And you look at the, you look at the disciples before Jesus sent the helper, Right? And then you look at them after. What happens when we see in Acts 2 when the Holy Spirit comes? They go out. They're courageous. They're bold. They're preaching the gospel. They're generous. They're more surrendered people. And so this is what happens in the Holy Spirit. When you think about the Holy Spirit working through you, think about the fruit of the Spirit. Love and joy and peace and patience and kindness and goodness and faithfulness and gentleness and self-control. Like, those things are good for us. Like, it's good that I experience patience if the Holy Spirit's working in me, but ultimately, His work in me is going to be felt by someone else, right? And so He's going to work through you. So there's going to be other people on the receiving end of our love, the love we give, or the joy we have. Other people are going to experience the peace we possess, or the patience we demonstrate, or the kindness that we offer, or the goodness we emanate, or the faithfulness we demonstrate, or the gentleness we display, or the self-control we express. And so he's teaching us about such things and then empowering us to live it out through us. 
So if you're a Christian parent, it's the Holy Spirit that's given you this intense and unbreakable love for your child, especially their soul and eternity. If you're a Christian son or daughter, it's the Spirit that teaches you how to respect and obey your parents. Christian teachers, it's the Spirit that's stirring a desire to influence your teachers far, or your students far beyond their report cards. As a Christian medical professional, it's the Spirit that gives you a greater sense of mercy and care for your patients. As a Christian business person, it's the Spirit creating a deeper sense of integrity in your business dealings. As a Christian neighbor, it's the Spirit that compels you to walk next door or across the street to engage your neighbor, hoping that at some point you'll get to share the love of Christ with them. This is what happens when we come to Christ and then the Holy Spirit moves in into us and then he works in us and through us. And so yes, we have challenges every day, battles we fight every day, wondering if we're gonna be uh, able to have victory and in the Holy Spirit, we can. I wanna, I wanna illustrate it this way. Let's say that this vase is us, right? Well, if you are not a Christian yet, you have not come to that point to surrender your life to Christ, it's kind of like this. If the water represents the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit isn't coming into you. He's working around you. He's kind of doing stuff around you, but he's not going into you. But the second you come to faith in Christ, what happens is then the Holy Spirit fills you up, and now the presence of God is in you. And then you think about the challenges you have. Like, will I be able to overcome that sin? Yes, because not only is he in you, he's going to start to work through you and flow out of you. Am I going to be able to, you know, have victory over these areas of struggle? Yes, because the Holy Spirit's in you, and then he's flowing out of you. And some of you are going, great, your analogy kind of stinks because now you're out of the Holy Spirit. Well, no, because the Holy Spirit never stops. <laughs> I don't have the strength for the situation. Yes, you do, because I'm in you and I'm working through you. I don't know if I'm going to be able to witness to my friend because they're really, you know, having a hard time. No, because I'm in you and through you. And the Holy Spirit just keeps working in you and through you, and he doesn't stop because he's God. And you're thinking, really? Now your pictures are empty. Well, I've got a baptismal back here. <laughs> so we can do this all day long, people. Like, God's just going to keep it going in you, through you, in you, through you, in you, through you. This is what the Lord does for his children. And so as we think about application, like the very first thing you have to realize is if you don't know Christ, if you're sitting here trying to do life on your own, like you're tapping into human wisdom, human strength, human thinking, you're going to get human results is that really what you want to do with the rest of your life? Is that really how you want to posture yourself for what's after this life? Because after this life is the next life forever, apart from God or with God. And so if you don't have Christ as your Savior, the first application is come to Christ and believe in him. Believe in his death on the cross for your sin. Believe in his resurrection. And, and you don't have to do anything fancy. You can just say, Lord, I believe. Come into my life. I'm a sinner. I'm broken. Come in. Move in. I need you in my life. And if you do that, we want to come alongside you and celebrate with you and encourage you. And so if you're here in this room and your program is a spot on your response card that you can say, I'm coming to Christ. And mark that, man, just with excitement and joy. Say, I'm giving my life to Christ, and then we'll get in touch with you in the days to come and say, here's how to grow in that relationship. If you're watching online, you can email us at CVC Connect or connect at cvconline.org. But what about those of us as believers that already have Christ? Well, if he's working in you and through you, I want to give you a couple of application questions, but I want to give you an application thought. Everyone say, do it. Yeah. Everyone say, see it. And then say, share it. Yeah. Your application is to do it, see it, share it. What's that mean? First application question about the Holy Spirit in you. What is something in your life that the Holy Spirit has been convincing you to start or stop doing? Because as the Holy Spirit's working in you, he's telling you to start something. Maybe you need to be a, a missionary. Maybe you need to you know, step out. You need to stop a sinful habit. You need to start getting in the word of God, whatever it is. What is it that he wants you to start? Or what is it something he wants you to stop? And as the Holy Spirit gives you that answer, here's your application. Do it. Just obey. Then what? See what happens. Just see what happens. See how God shows up. 
And then what? Then share it with other Christians who can rejoice with you and encourage you and hold you accountable and those kinds of things. So what's God telling you to do? Well, I really need to start getting in my Bible, reading it. Do it. See how God shows up. Share it with another believer. Man, I've been in my Bible. You know what God's been showing me? But he also wants to work through you. Next application question. What has the Holy Spirit been impressing on you to say or do for someone else? What's the Holy Spirit been impressing on you to do or say for someone else? Is it sharing your faith? Is it just loving on them? Is it forgiving them? Well, what do you need to do? Do it. Just obey. Do what the Holy Spirit tells you. Then what? See what happens. Forgive that person. Step out and love on that person as God shows you. And then share that with some other believers. Man, you wouldn't see how God shows up. I, I did this and did that and God showed up. Like, just do it. See what happens. Share with others. That's my challenge to you as you get ready to head out here today. But before we leave, we get the joy of hearing and seeing some of the fruit of what happens when the Holy Spirit works. And we're going to see some baptisms here in a few minutes of God just transforming life. People who came to faith in Christ, Holy Spirit's coming to them, and now they're living for him to the best of their ability in the Spirit. And we're going to celebrate that. But would you pray with me? Father, thank you for today. Thanks for your Holy Spirit. God, we just confess it's, it's kind of mind-blowing that you would love us enough to even want to move into this house. <laughs> it's messy. There's, there's dirt and gunk. There's broken things. But you just come in anyways. And you clean it up. You tidy it up. You repair broken things or you replace them with things that are even better. God, would you forgive us for neglecting such the beautiful gift of yourself and your spirit? God, would you forgive us for not tapping into this power that the God of the universe has put inside of us to speak and act ways that can change the world? God, we're so weak and cowardly. Would you forgive us for caring more about the opinions of people than the opinions of of our Heavenly Father. So do a work on our life. Lord, I pray for those people here and online maybe that they need to surrender their lives to you as Savior. Would you just give them the courage, the strength, the conviction to turn to you today to let us know how we can help them. And Father, would you help us to start or stop what we need to do in our life so that you can continue to work in us through your Spirit? And would you allow us to step out and do what you want us to do or say to someone else? because of your spirit. And Father, thank you for the gift of celebration that we get right now to watch these brothers and sisters share joyfully what you've done in their life. We love you. We praise you. In Jesus' name, we all sit together.